Okay, welcome back to class. Uh, so in the first hour, we were looking at uh, the why of the incarnation. Uh, why did God have to become man? And we looked at various uh, uh, reasons and we were looking at uh, how he conquered uh, sin in the flesh. And we looked at Romans chapter 8 verses uh, 3 and 4. And we said that uh, what the law could not do, uh, you know, it was God did by sending his own son in the likeness of uh, sinful flesh. Now, what the law could not do, uh, the law could not keep, uh, help us keep the righteous demands that God demanded from us uh, to keep his righteous ways. Uh, it uh, the law also did not uh, provide, uh, you know, any spiritual strength or did not sp uh, offer any spiritual aid uh, for us or help us to keep uh, uh, the laws, the righteous demands of God's laws. And hence, we see and we read in the Old Testament that uh, man failed from time to time to keep the laws, the commandments, the righteous uh, uh, demands of God's law. Uh, and we hence see that, you know, sin dominated uh, man's flesh, okay? And there was no way they were able to overcome uh, the sin uh, that dominated their flesh. And hence, because sin dominated their flesh, they were not able to keep the law. They were not able to keep the commandments of God. And hence, they always fell short of the righteous standards or the demands of uh, God. So we see that God took that step and sent his own son in the likeness of human f uh, flesh. And Jesus came with all the limitations, the frailties, the weakness of a hu uh, human being. He took on the physical body, um, you know, so that he can uh, be that body which can make, uh, you know, the atonement for our sin. Or he took on the physical body which for man was... Um, uh, a, a vehicle or a means to indulge in sin and ungodliness. So God sent his son uh, in the likeness of human flesh with all the weakness and frailties, but yet God showed us that uh, in the flesh we can overcome temptations, we can uh, overcome the sinful di dictates of the flesh, uh, we can keep the righteous demands of God's law. So, um, it, what the law could not do does not mean the law was uh, insufficient or it, the law was uh, unholy or it was uh, not able to. The law was given by God, so it was not that, but it was because uh, of man's flesh, you know, man's flesh was dictated by sin, it was dominated by sin, um, uh, man's sinful nature was dominated by sin and hence they could not keep the law, they fell short of the law and also the law was no way uh, able to strengthen or aid people uh, to keep the righteous demands of God and hence we see that, you know, uh, Christ came in uh, uh, Jesus came in the human flesh with all its weaknesses, with all its faithies, but yet showed to us that we can in this human flesh keep the righteous uh, demands or the commands of God, keep the laws and the commandments of God. We can still do his will and we can also overcome uh, the sinful human uh, nature uh, or the, uh, uh, the human nature which is dominated by flesh. And God showed it to us, Jesus showed it to us by living himself as a, a human being and setting us an example and being the model so we don't have any um, excuses. And we also will see how God made a way to help us, um, to aid us, to strengthen us, to keep his righteous demands, his righteous commands and his uh, laws. Okay, so we look at uh, that uh, as we go through this chapter. Um, now we look at two reasons why God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay, um, he sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. Okay, uh, we read that in uh, Hebrew, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and uh, 4. Okay, it says in verse 3, we read, 
for what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of uh, sin. Okay, so if you look at this phrase on account of sin in the literal Greek translation, it has a very sacrificial connotation to the whole uh, meaning of this phrase. So if you read uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 3, the latter half of that verse, if you read it in the New International Version, it says, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering and if you read the same uh, verse in uh, the amplified bible it says uh, sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh as an offering for sin okay uh, so we just look again at uh, this whole aspect of uh, sin offering or the sacrificial offering uh, god sent his son in the flesh so that he could be the sin offering and it's referring here again to the or uh, sin offering that was made on the day of atonement okay um so we have this recorded for us in leviticus 16 i already told you that two goats were uh, taken um, for this special day, for this day of atonement, for the sacrifice, uh, for this atoning ceremony. One was the sacrificial goat and the other was the scapegoat. So the sacrificial goat was the goat which was made for the sin offering uh, and hence it had to be killed and uh, the, the blood was taken by the, the high priest into the Holy of Holies and was sprinkled on the, you know, the mercy seat uh, of the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And then there was the scapegoat, uh, basically which was a sin bearer so like i said they would uh, the priest would lay the hands his hands on that goat uh, signifying laying the whole sins of the entire uh, israelite race on this um, scapegoat and it was uh, led away into the wilderness okay uh, and in, hence it uh, it was very symbolic in a way that it uh, it carried away the sins of the people and so we see that the writer of hebrews is presenting jesus as both our sin offering and our sin bearer okay so jesus bore our sins he took upon the sins of the entire mankind like that scapegoat uh, uh, that was uh, on which was laid the entire sins of the israelite and was sent off in the wilderness in the same way Jesus became uh, the sin bearer where he bore the sins of the entire mankind uh, on his body. He took upon it, it upon himself and he died on the cross. He became our sin offering uh, and he made that full sufficient perfect uh, sacrifice. So in Romans chapter 8 verses 3 and 4 which we read, uh, it specifically uh, it speaks about Jesus coming in the flesh to be our sin offering and also be our sin bearer. And he came in the flesh to be the sin offering uh, to, uh, to be sacrificed on the account for all of our uh, sins. Okay. And then we also read in the same verse that uh, he was condemned, he condemned sin in the uh, flesh. Okay, uh, we see that God condemned sin, which means uh, condemned sin means he subdued, he overcame, and he deprived uh, sin of its uh, power. Okay, if you read the same uh, phrase in the Amplified Version, it says it, he subdued, overcame, and deprived uh, uh, of its power. Okay, so in the flesh, Jesus subdued, overcame, and deprived uh, sin of its power. Uh, and he did it in the same environment uh, where sin reigned, okay? So where does sin reign? Sin reigns in our flesh, and that is why we are not able to keep the righteous demands of the law. Why? Because uh, sin dominates our body, sin reigns in our body. But we see that Jesus Christ had to come in the same flesh, and, uh, you know, in the same flesh, we see that he subdued, overcame, and deprived a uh, sin of its um, 
power. So where sin reigned in the flesh, uh, we see that God in Christ Jesus, who became incarnate, uh, broke the power of sin through the very means that leads us into more sinfulness. He broke it. He broke sin power in the flesh. So in the incarnation, God broke the power of sin. Uh, therefore, you know, it, uh, he sets us an example. Uh, he gives us the assurance. Uh, and he also uh, gives us this uh, great uh, hope uh, that, you know, we don't have to be uh, uh, subjected to the dictates of the flesh. Uh, we can overpower uh, our carnal fleshly nature, our carnal fleshly desires. We can uh, bring into subjection, uh, you know, the dictates of our flesh, the power of sin that reigns in our flesh, in our body. Um, and instead, we can, f uh, we can do this with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, so why we could not keep the law because uh, the people could not keep the law because they did not have anyone to aid them spiritually or strengthen them. Uh, but, uh, you know, we as uh, the New Covenant believers, the New Testament believers, uh, uh, not sorry, not New Testament, New Covenant believers, um, you know, uh, we have this great hope, we have this great privilege compared to people who live in the Old Testament um, that, you know, we have uh, Jesus as our model who uh, in the same flesh with all its weakness and frailties was able to overcome every temptation, was able to overcome every dictate of the flesh and not given to sin, remain sinless. And hence he sets an, as an example that we too can overcome the dictates of the flesh. And uh, we also see that he did it through the empowering uh, uh, power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we have also received the promise of the Father, the promise gift of the Father, that is uh, the Holy Spirit who lives in us, who guides us, who leads us, who teaches us uh, uh, and leads us into all truth. And he empowers us and strengthens us to overcome the dictates of the flesh, to keep the righteous demands uh, of God and uh, and he, uh, the Holy Spirit in us is also sanctifying us uh, to help us to be blameless and live holy lives um, uh, so that we can be presented holy, blameless, without fault and without any blemish before the Most High God. Okay, so to keep the righteous demands of God's law and the commandments uh, by the righteousness of Jesus and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So we can keep the righteous demands of God's law uh, because we have the righteousness of God. We are being clothed uh, with the righteousness of God. We are covered with the righteousness of God, of Jesus Christ. And we are also empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So we we'll look at why did Jesus have to partake or become flesh and blood? And why did Jesus have to share in our uh, humanity? We've also, we've looked at uh, certain aspects of it. We will look at it more in detail. We'll study Hebrews chapter 2, verses uh, 14 and uh, 18. And then we will also go on to talk about uh, the law and how Jesus came to fulfill the law uh, and how he helped us uh, keep the uh, law. Okay, so we look at the law in a little more study, a little more in detail. Uh, before that, we will answer this question. Why did Jesus have to partake uh, of flesh and blood? And why did Jesus have to share in our uh, humanity? Uh, so we'll look at the passage in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 18. And uh, we look at three purposes for the incarnation and the consequences of it. So can somebody please read uh, Hebrews chapter 4? 2 verses 14 and 18, please. Hebrews 2, 14 and 18. Hey, In as much then, sorry, you want to go ahead, Zeli? Who was reading? Uh, Nicole, Nicholson, please go ahead. Zilatoli okay. is read so we can hear your voice. It's really okay. nice to hear your voice. <laughs> in, as much, uh, in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, 
that is a power of death that is the devil 15 continue to 18 or just 18 after? yes please continue to 18 okay and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for indeed he does not give aid to angels but he does give aid to the seed of abraham therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make a proper propitiation for the sins of the people for in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted thank you nicholson um, so this is a very very powerful uh, a fully loaded uh, verses uh, which is talking about um, you know uh, what jesus did for us uh, in his flesh and blood okay uh, so we look at uh, the threefold purposes in this um, in this uh, uh, verses. Okay, firstly we look that uh, we look at uh, 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 at this point that Jesus shared in our humanity uh, to destroy the power of death. Okay, so we've already looked at it. Uh, Christ shared in our humanity so that uh, through His death, He could destroy the one who had. The power of death, that is the uh, devil. Okay, uh, we studied about this when we looked at it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, can somebody read Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? And somebody else can read 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. So, can somebody read Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, please? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put empty between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his ill. Amen. Thank you. Uh, someone else can read 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Thank you, John. So here we are looking at um, the first point in what we can learn from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 18, that uh, Jesus shared in our humanity that he might destroy him who had the power of death, and that is the... Um, Devil, so Jesus uh, shared in our humanity so that through his death he could destroy, uh, you know, uh, the power of death that is the devil. And we looked at this Old Testament prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which we've already studied about it in the in the previous classes. We learned for, we, that from this word that the seed of the woman, which is a capital S, is referring to the Messiah, referring to the Logos, referring to Jesus Christ. He would come and he would crush the head of the serpent serpent symbolic of uh, of satan and we see that christ came to fulfill uh, this prophecy uh, we also heard as it was read in 1 john chapter 3 verse 8 uh, where uh, john writes that christ came to destroy the works of the devil okay not only did christ destroy the works of the devil through his death but uh, christ destroyed the devil himself destroyed his power nullified his power and he's rendered powerless um but uh, if you think oh but you know the devil still is so powerful it's because we give him the power uh you know but we have been given um we have greater power uh, because we've, uh, we, Scripture tells us that everything that we need for life and godliness, God has given us. He has given us the weapons. Our weapons are not of carnal nature, uh, you know, uh, but is uh, powerful in Christ Jesus for bringing down or tearing down every works of the uh, evil one. So the word destroy here in um, uh, we see we 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 saw that Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, again okay, destroyed the devil himself. The word destroy 
destroy here in Greek means to paralyze, to undo, uh, to bring to nothing, uh, to make to no effect. So we see that Christ reduced uh, Satan's power uh, to nothing. Um, he, undo, he undid everything that uh, the devil had planned. He has paralyzed him uh, totally um, and uh, he has brought him to nothing and uh, he has no effect. Uh, so you can celebrate with this, uh, you know, with this uh, great uh, victory that Jesus has won on the cross and this victory that he has not just won for himself, but this victory he also shares uh, with us. And um, so don't be intimidated or afraid of the devil and don't think that he's uh, causing a lot of confusion, pain, sickness uh, in your life. You have greater power because he's already rendered, uh, you know, as uh, nothing. He's paralyzed. Uh, he cannot do anything, but he can do it to the extent that you uh, give him uh, the room or you open the doors or you give him the freedom or you assign him the uh, you know the authority and the power to um, do so but we see that on the cross uh, in the flesh uh, Jesus, uh, you know, also destroyed the devil himself. He ba basically made him of no effect and paralyzed him. Okay. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 uh, tells us that on the cross, Jesus disarmed all principalities and powers. So can somebody read that please? Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Thank you. So uh, here principalities and powers are referring to demonic hosts. Um, so on the cross, uh, Christ, you know, Jesus openly uh, displayed his triumph uh, over uh, the power of Satan, over the power of sin. Uh, he destroyed um, uh, Satan and he openly displayed his triumph in the heavenly realms as well. So if you notice here that Christ defeated uh, the devil or he triumphed over the devil as a human being and not in his or uh, him being deity or not him being God. Uh, we see that Christ defeated uh, the devil, triumphed over him as a human being. And in his humanity, uh, Christ uh, defeated the devil. Uh, and he was uh, hence a representative of the human race. Uh, and that is why Hebrews chapter 2 refers to him as, uh, you know, the captain of our salvation so the captain of our salvation that is jesus christ uh, who became like one of us defeated the devil on our behalf and so as our captain uh, jesus shares his victory with us and hence uh, you know we share in his victory as well because he was one like us and being one like us he uh, defeated satan he uh, defeated sin um, and he shares his victory with us and hence we also, uh, you know, can um, share in his uh, victory and we also have this assurance that, um, you know, we don't have to be under Satan, we don't have to be under his power and we also don't have to live according to the uh, dictates or the power dictates of the flesh that reigns in us, we can overcome it. Okay. The second thing that uh, we can learn from uh, this verse, uh, second aspect that we can learn from this verse in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 14 and uh, 18, is that um, you know, having destroyed the devil, Christ can now bring uh, deliverance. So, uh, you know, people in this world have no assurance about uh, life after death and hence they are so afraid to die because of where they will land up or, or how they will be or what they're going to become. Uh, so the fear of death holds people in 
uh, bondage. And even as we as believers, some of us can be under this, uh, you know, uh, this whole cloud or uh, this whole bondage of uh, being under the fear of death because, uh, you know, we are so afraid to leave this world. Um, we're so afraid to go into an unseen realm that we do not know of. Uh, but, you know, um, yeah, people who have... Uh, tasted death and have gone to heaven and have come back they said they you know it it was such a wonderful experience just to be in that glorious body uh, they did not want to come back into their physical body they just uh, kind of detested it they even though they had uh, their their, uh, their husband their children uh, their spouses you know uh, they didn't want to come back even though they had their responsibility even though they left their family because they didn't want to come back into this this uh, you know frail weak uh, uh, sinful and uh, uh, sick bodies uh, because of the glorious body that they had received which was something that they just can't even comprehend or even even explain and the beautiful place uh, that heaven is so you know um, we see that uh, we too can live in that bondage of fear. Uh, does not have to be only unbelievers. But when Christ triumphed over the devil on the cross and destroyed him, uh, you know, uh, he has released us from this uh, whole fear. Okay, not only fear of sin, fear of bondages, fear of addictions, but also the fear of death that uh, we were living under, that we were submerged uh, under. And so we have this... Um, great news that uh, we can assure ourselves that, you know, um, that on the cross, in the body, uh, in the human body, Jesus destroyed the devil, destroyed uh, death, and death has uh, no longer can bring about fear or intimidate us, um, you know, and we can also share this uh, good news with the world uh, who are held in the fear of uh, death. The third thing that we can look at here in this from this verse in Hebrews is that the, that Christ is the merciful and faithful high priest uh, who make the atonement for the sins of the uh, people. So can somebody uh, again read uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 please? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Thank you, John. So here it says that Jesus became like us. He had to become like uh, one among us so that he can be a merciful and faithful uh, high priest uh, uh, in things relating to God so that he can make the atonement for the sins of the people like I said in Levit Leviticus chapter 16 where you know the high priest um, enters into the uh, holy of holies and uh, you know makes a sacrifice for the sins of the people uh, people uh, so also we see here that uh, jesus um, you know uh, uh, became uh, had became like one of us so that he could take the place of being the merciful and faithful high priest and uh, minister to us and uh, uh, with things relating to god and also to make the atonement for the sins of the people okay um, so we see the Old Testament that is the high priest who offered sacrifices on behalf of the people to atone for their sins. Uh, he also was the one who represented the people before God um, uh, when he went into the Holy of Holies and hence the high priest had to be one like the people. Therefore, we see that one of the main purposes of the incarnation was also that Christ could become uh, one like us, and therefore he could represent us before the Father, uh, and uh, not only just represent us before the Father, he could also be a compassionate and faithful high priest, uh, because he was he became like us. He understands our weaknesses and frailties, and he can um, intercede on behalf of us. He can mediate on behalf of us uh, before uh, uh, the Father. Okay, uh, look at what 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 says. Can one of you read that please? 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. 
my dear children i write this to you so that you will not sin but if anybody does sin we have one who speaks to the father in our defense jesus christ the righteous one thank you uh, john so here uh, the bible we read that uh, you know jesus became our advocate our lawyer our intercessor he stands and he defends us he uh, you know defends our case he fights on behalf of us uh, and um, he intercedes on behalf of us he mediates on behalf of us uh, because he is he had become one like us and hence he became our faithful and merciful high priest and he still uh, you know continuing the role of being our mediator of being our high priest on uh, inter uh, interceding on behalf behalf of us and also telling God the father you know that uh, to asking him to forgive us since because of the sacrifice that he has made the atoning sacrifice that he has made for our uh, sins so and this is jesus christ the righteous one uh, who has uh, become our mediator who is our lawyer and our um, intercessor okay one more aspect of the inter uh, incarnation we see in hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 and 16 it says therefore uh, it because of the incarnation uh, because jesus walked as man he too was tempted just as we are tempted uh, but he overcame temptation okay jesus we read only one of his temptations may i mention in matthew but we know that he would be tempted in various other ways as well um so jesus christ became like one of us and uh, being a man he was tempted just as we are but he did not give in to temptation so hence he also sets us an example in that way uh, and saying that you know while we are tempted uh, we can overcome uh, temptation because he too overcame temptation he too overcame the dictates of the flesh he did not uh, give in to that he overcame temptation uh, by speaking the word of god and uh, hence he gives us uh, or sets us an example or shows us how we too can overcome temptation and um, it says here that you know um, he was tempted in every way and but he overcome and he is able to assist and aid um, uh, and relieve those who have been tempted or those who are being tested and those who are being tried so we have this uh, you no know, faithful high priest the faithful god uh, who became incarnate so that you know he can understand our human frailties he went through temptations he went to various tests and trials and he overcame it and he sets us an example and because he was tempted he understands what we go through and he is able to assist us when we go through temptation he is able to aid us and he is also able to uh, help us so very powerful words that we have in hebrews chapter 2 uh, verses 14 and 18 um, and uh, verse 16 says um, you know for indeed he does not give aid to angels but he does give aid to the seed of abraham so how wonderful that we have this god Uh, who understands us who's gracious and compassionate and merciful he knows us he understands our weaknesses because he came in the flesh basically to understand what we go through and because he's able he was he came in the flesh he is able to give us the needed aid and the strength to help us like i said you know that uh, in the old testament they were not able to keep the righteous demands of the law because the law did not give them the spiritual aid did not strengthen them did not help them but uh, thanks be to god that we have jesus who is uh, you know uh, his uh, there always to aid us uh, give strength to the seed of abraham that is you and i and also we have the promise gift of the holy spirit who is able to uh, uh, help us okay so these are uh, the three powerful things that we learn through um, hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 18 the three a uh, fold purpose of uh, why jesus had to partake in flesh and blood and why did he have to share in our uh humanity okay uh we look at uh, another point about why he had to come in the flesh is to redeem those under the law uh 
Okay, uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Can somebody who's never read, can we hear your voice? Can somebody please read Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, please? Anyone? Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Jeffina, can you read, please? Uh, shall I read? Uh, Colossians chapter 4, sir. Thank you, success. Okay, we'll... Uh, hear. Thank you, John. Uh, but we'll just have success read. Okay, success. Go ahead. Colossians chapter 4. Verses well, 4 verse to one. 7. Okay, 4 Galatians to 7. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. From verse 4 now, that I may make it manifest as ought to speak. Verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without. Uh, success is Galatians. Yes, it's Galatians is it, success. It's, it's Galatians Colossian, chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Sorry, I can't hear you because you, your uh, volume is too low. Oh, okay. it's, sorry. No it's worries. Colossian. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Thank you, John. Okay. I'll read Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to, re to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his sons, the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also and air. Uh, thank you, John. Sorry, success. Uh, maybe we next time we'll get you to read a verse. Okay. Uh, so here we see, uh, you know, uh, God always fulfills his uh, word. We read here in John, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, when the fullness of time had come, uh, God sent forth his son. So we see God always fulfills his word in the fullness of time. Although the incarnation had been told Thousands of years before, it was at the right time, the appropriate time, uh, you know, in the due season that God sent his son. Now, in this passage, uh, it reveals, uh, uh, you know, the many purposes of the incarnation. We see Christ came to redeem uh, those under the law. Uh, that we might receive the adoption as uh, sons. So we basically look at a brief uh, background to the book of Galatians uh, and the passage and why this passage is being quoted and will help us to understand in a greater measure what Christ came to uh, do. So uh, the epistle of Galatians, uh, Paul is writing to the group of churches uh, located in Asia Minor uh, in a region called Galatia, which basically included the towns of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Uh, there were both Jews and Gentiles who had come to faith in Jesus Christ in this, uh, in this region of uh, Galatia. And there were some uh, Jews, Judaizers, uh, who taught, uh, who were, uh, you know, who had accepted Jesus, who came into the church, and they thought that, uh, you know, they taught the Gentiles and others that they had to keep certain Old Testament practices, uh, even after they became believers. And one of them uh, was, uh, you know, uh, the, the ritual of circumcision, okay? So they said, in addition to exercising your faith in Christ Jesus, you also have to fulfill fulfill this uh, ritual of circumcision. And uh, this was not what Paul uh, thought. Uh, so, you know, because Paul had not taught this and Paul was totally against this teaching, uh, the Judaeus began to discredit Paul's apostleship, uh, saying that he's not an apostle. They declared him as someone being inferior to all the other leaders and apostles. And in this uh, background, uh, you know, with this issue, Paul is addressing this letter or writing this letter to the churches at Galatia. So in chapters 1 and 2, he def Paul defends his apostleship uh, by declaring how he received his, his the gospel 
uh, that he received it from Jesus himself and not from any other apostles and hence he is not inferior the calling of God as an apostle was not something he took upon himself but it was the will of God and then in chapter 3 uh, Paul declares how the Gentile Christians became the descendants of Abraham uh, through Christ and as I had mentioned uh, it was uh, Abraham did not have the law but he was credited as uh, righteous in God's sight uh, he was accounted as righteous not because of him keeping the law because the law had not been given to him at that time but it was because of his uh, faith and so Paul is saying all those who believe by faith in Christ Jesus uh, they automatically become uh, descendants of Abraham they come under the covenant blessing they receive the uh, blessing and that is not by keeping the law not by keeping certain rituals but it is through faith in Christ uh, Jesus and then he states that the law uh, was, uh, you know, intended only as something as an intermediary uh, disciplinary system. Uh, but when Christ came, uh, you know, the law was put to an end. And then uh, Paul proceeds to show uh, how those who belong in Christ will inherit the blessings uh, uh, or the covenant blessings of Abraham, the promise of the covenant blessings to Abraham, and how they can escape, uh, you know, the condemnation and the curse of the law. So if you look at this, we will think, okay, is the law cursed? Is the law not holy? Is the law not right? Is the law, uh, was the law when God gave it, did it fall short of certain uh, standards? No, the law served uh, the law was good it served its purposes uh, the law you know made us uh, made the people aware of sin it does still make us aware of sin if there is no law we would not know uh, you know where we have uh, gone against God where we have missed his righteous standing uh, righteous demands what he requires of us so the law makes us aware of sin and yes the law is good it served its purpose uh, it served its purpose in the sense that it exposed sin uh, and the sinful desires of the flesh uh, we also see that the law is holy and just and good because it is given by a God who is holy, a God who is just, a God who is good. And the law is spiritual uh, because it was uh, given by uh, God. Okay, So the law served its part in pointing out to our sin and it also pointed out to Jesus Christ. Uh, so as Paul explains in uh, Galatians that the law in fact served in preserving the people uh, through whom the Savior would come. So the law had been established. It was upheld. It was made to stand. So the law was good that it served a purpose. It made us aware of sin. Uh, the more we were aware of sin, uh, you know, uh, the more people wanted to break it. Okay, so why do we why do we break it? Because sin dwells in us, sin dwelt in us, uh, and in our flesh there was nothing good, but sin reigned in our mortal body, sin reigned in our carnal nature, and the law of sin was working in our flesh. Okay, so the law of sin was dominating our flesh, and um, and the sin it was a law that was controlling our body and because of the sin that was a law that was controlling our body or the law of sin that was controlling or working in our flesh we could not keep the righteous demands of uh, of God's law that was holy that was good that was perfect and so Paul reveals that just as a believer is uh, dead to sin uh, you know, the believer also now is dead to the law of sin that controls uh, the body, the law of sin that dictates the flesh. And uh, hence, he says, they are free from the law. Uh, but when he says that, he does not mean that the law is sinful or evil in itself. The real problem is not the law, uh, but it's the sin that rules and dominates the flesh and the members of our uh, body okay so the law required people to do things in the strength of their own flesh uh, which was impossible for them which I already said and hence we see that sin kind of dominated the flesh because they could not control it uh, they did not have 
uh, you know, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit to help them. They did not have the model that Jesus Christ set. So sin was uh, more noticeable than people keeping the righteous demands of the law. And hence we see that, uh, you know, uh, more and more people's sin or the weakness of their flesh was uh, uh, exposed. Okay, and uh, we see we read in uh, Galatians chapter four, verse three, that Paul says that Christ came to set us free uh, from these um, weak and beggarly elements, which he mentions in Galatians chapter four, verse nine. So Paul is basically saying that uh, these rituals of circumcision, the keeping of the law, you know, is uh, is not going to give us freedom. It's uh, you know, it's going to push us down even more into giving into the sinful dictates or the law of sin that reigns in our body. But he says, now we can be free. We can live as sons and daughters because we have been set free by uh, Jesus Christ. And he says, we need to realize this truth and not go back into keeping the rituals or uh, just keeping the law because the law could not do anything to help us. So God does not want his people to be bound on the rituals and traditions, but Paul admonishes us saying that we need to stand firm, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has made us free and not, you know, be entangled again in the yoke of bondage, which he talks in Galatians chapter uh, 5 verse 1. Okay, so here the whole thing is that we need to balance our liberty. Yes, we've been set free. We've been, uh, you know, we have freedom in Christ. Uh, but Paul states that, uh, you know, because you have this liberty, don't use this liberty to again as an opportunity to give in to the sinful dictates of the flesh. But he says, you know, overcome the sinful dictates of the flesh and love and serve one and other. So in this context, he brings about the law. So we see how the law uh, was holy and good, but the law was not able to hear, aid us and strengthen us. Uh, but what overtook us was the law of sin, this, the, the, this, the law of sin that uh, dealt in our body that kind of controlled us. And Jesus came to give us even freedom from that law of sin that reigned in our mortal bodies. Okay. And we'll end by looking at the divine exchange in um, that happened on the cross in Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse nine, where it says, "For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, and you through his poverty might become rich." Okay, so we have seen a great deal uh, in all that was involved in incarnation. And uh, we can sum up this whole purpose of incarnation in just this one verse that is given in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, where it says, uh, Christ became poor for our sakes so that we, through his poverty, could become rich. Okay, so we see that Christ came down to our level to lift us to his level, uh, you know, to be at the right hand of God. And uh, that's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 6. We're seated at the right hand of God. Christ became what we were so that we can become what he is. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Christ became our sin so that we can become his righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And Christ became a was cursed on the cross so that we could experience the spiritual blessings or we could be blessed with every spiritual blessing as we read in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, Christ uh, took upon our sickness. Uh, we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that by his stripes we are healed. He took upon our sicknesses so that we can receive his healing, we can receive uh, his wholeness and we can live uh, whole lives. Uh, Christ became the son of man so that we can become the children of God. John chapter 1 verse 12. Christ was born in subjection to the law so that those under the law could be redeemed. Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. And uh, Christ came to earth to tell us about the father. 
that he went to heaven to tell the father about us. That means he's interceding on behalf of us. He's our advocate, our lawyer, our great high priest who is, uh, you know, uh, who is advocating, who is interceding, uh, who's fighting on behalf of us. And we see that in the incarnation, God taking on the human form is God coming down to be with man. And in the resurrection, uh, we see that man is being raised uh, back to be with the Father. That's why we're seated at the right hand of God, as it says in Ephesians. Okay, And then also the last thing is Christ was separated from the Father. Uh, and hence we who were separated from God, who are enemies with God, no longer are enemies with God, but we can be reconciled back to God. Okay. So this was uh, chapter 7. Uh, we look at the, the last bit again uh, in the next class. We'll read all the verses. Uh, but uh, chapter 7 basically talked about the purpose of incarnation. Okay. Any questions, any comments, any doubts? No, if not, I would request you all to please. Uh, yes, uh, Nicholson. Yeah. Um, can you hear me, Pastor? Yeah, a little louder, please. Yeah. So I just wanted a clarification if I was right in understanding this. So uh, like you had mentioned, the first covenant was not wrong in any way. But if you look at Hebrews 8, verse 7, it talks. Uh, I'll just read out Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. Uh, For... Sorry, Nicholson, I can't really hear you. Um... Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, what we'll do is you can just um, uh, maybe post your question on the on the stream page sure. in Google Classroom because we've already run out of cl class and I have to, you know, get to my next class. Uh, I have over short time, sorry. Um, so we take up your question on the stream. I'll answer it or uh, I can also explain it uh, next class if that's okay. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Nicholson. Yeah. No problem, but you can surely post it on the stream and I will look at it and I will clarify your uh, your uh, doubt. Sure. Okay? Thanks so much. Okay, I request all of you to go through the notes and then maybe next week we can discuss on this chapter more uh, even as we look at the last bit again. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, doubts, we can uh, I can answer that. Okay. Thank you all for joining class. Um, have a good day and a good week ahead. God bless all of you. Thank you.